um, about this. Um, so yeah, if if uh, you know you're trying to prepare for the consumer choice fundamentals exam, just make sure that you take a look at you know the price expansion path and how that generates a demand curve and the income and substitution effect decomposition. And I will tell you one thing since you all are here. Um, if you guys have been playing around with this material and I've shown you before, but you know, and I, I, I'll try to put something I think on the um, cover page of the exam and remind you on Thursday. But um, the, the biggest kind of problem you can end up with on this particular homework set is when your alpha parameter for the utility function isn't a fraction, right? It's greater than one. And so you wanna look out for that. And then the other thing too, is remember for all of this stuff to work, you have to have a change in the price of tacos. So every once in a while, um, you'll get an exam that doesn't have the, the price of tacos changing. And in both of those cases, you would just want to use the substitute exam questions and, um, you know, document, you know, at the beginning, you know, okay, I'm using substitute exam questions for questions, you know, like 12 through, through 18 or something like that, because, you know, when I got down there, my, my parameters were out of range or my price of tacos wasn't changing. And that's perfectly fine. But, but um, you kind of want to be on your toes because in the past, you know, what, the main thing that we've been worried about is if, you know, something turns out as a zero or we had some weird rendering thing where we had, you know, two plus signs or two minus signs. Um, but, but here it's a little different. So this one is, is the one you want <clears throat> to be more careful with and more conscientious of <clears throat> looking at your questions before you just try to solve them. Um, and again, this is stuff you guys all know, but, but um, you know, you have to bring your judgment um, to the exam questions. Uh, that's part of your test. Okay. Oh, Professor, uh, could you yeah. go for an example of an income decomposition graph? Um, no. <laughs> And Thanks. and the only reason the only reason why I'm not going to do it is because we did it. So I know it's there in the videos, and I don't want to spend the whole lecture um, a, a explaining the whole thing in gory detail um, again. Um, but I know you guys are I know you guys are getting back um, from um, the from the break. So I will do one thing for you really quickly, Michael. And you help me, okay? So you 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 stay with me. You're here, right? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So st stay live. Don't just turn your mic off really quickly because I'm gonna ask you. So this is the thing you should you should it should look familiar. Okay. I've got, um, you know, two goods. I'm just gonna call them X and why right and usually the analysis unfolds like this where um i end up with with one initial budget constraint right and then the price of x falls is that looking familiar yeah okay and um then because of that, and this is the part that's hard for me, right, to draw. Um, I end up with two optimal consumption bundles. 
So this is the tangency condition on two different indifference curves. Right? Now, I will tell you, uh, um, this is the onus is on all of you um, to be responsible for this graph in gory detail because um, we spent a lot of time on it. And um, there are a lot of subtleties where you can miss a couple of points here and there. I mean, if, if uh, you, um, you know, only miss a couple of points, that's fine. But remember, you want to label everything. You want to make sure your difference curves are nice. Remember, quality matters here. Um, but, but so is this starting to look um, familiar, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. And then, then, um, so, so when you go to the videos and you look for this, so, so this distance here in the X dimension, this is our total change in the amount of X that's being consumed as a result of, of, um, the change in the price of X. That's our total change. Does that make sense? Are you good with mm -hmm. me now? Okay. But um, what we were able to, to do is um, we're able to uh, go ahead and divide that um, into an income effect and a substitution effect. And so I'm just going to put a little pink line here because this looks to me about right where, um, and I'm just going to draw it all the way through because I want to point out that this is XS on the line. And then in this particular case, the, the left side is going to be the substitution effect and the right side is going to be the income effect. And, um, but so does this diagram is starting to look familiar. We normally would, we'd label like X zero and X one. And, and so then the distance on the left would be the, the substitution effect and distance on the right would be the income effect. But that's just in this example. Sometimes they're flipped. Sometimes substitution effect is on the right and income effect is on the left. It just depends upon, um, um, you know, what was your initial um, situation. So, so um, by initial situation, I mean, you know, what was the original price of X? Um, you know, whether it was an increase or a decrease from that original price. But does this look familiar? So, yeah. so are, are you like good um, in that you'll be able to find it quickly, hopefully, and, and suss out the details on your own? Sure. Okay. So, so yeah, so, so, so this is basically the type of diagram you're going to be drawing with, you know, many of, 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 you know, the essentials are here, but I just say that, you know, there are probably some things that are missing from this and you want to be careful um, because depending upon the example you get, um, you know, where the substitution effect is and where the income effect could change. So yeah, it's definitely something um, worth spending some time on. Um, okay. And uh, just to, just for clarification, so there's could be two graphs, one on income uh, decomposition, one on price expansion, correct? Yeah, so that's the income and substitution effect decomposition and the other one that I've held res students responsible for in the past is also the price expansion path um, diagram. So there's going to be two graphs on the test. I didn't say that. <laughs> it could be both. It could be either one or the other. Um, so I don't know if you like to gamble. <laughs> so you can, you can, you know, but, but for me, they're both really straightforward um graphs so i don't i don't um you know uh hesitate to hold students responsible for both of them and they're both really important too 
Um, like I said, the first one basically ensures that like you and I are on the same page when I tell you that the consumer choice problem is going to produce the demand curve. And, and then the second one is this, you know, um, decomposition, which, um, you know, it basically explains why income effects matter. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's it. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going back here and, okay. So, so, um, let's talk. Christ. Oh, what's that? Sorry. Uh, I, got to, I think I was okay. unmuted. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. It, it, it's not related to this class. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, so, so let's go back to this, um, monopoly stuff. And and we'll talk about it for a minute. Uh, okay. Okay. So the the thing that you guys should um, have worked on on your own, and I'm not sure that everybody did. Um, but you know, it's 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 our next topic. Is remember, I told I told you guys the big point before we left um, regarding this newer material is that a monopoly and a cartel are the same idea, and and that's really what this assignment is about. And, and the only difference is a technical legal issue and, and not an economic one. So, so there's overlap between law and economics for sure. But um, the difference between a monopoly and a cartel is just about formally who owns the um, factories. And so, uh, in a cartel, you got two different owners that are coordinating their output and pricing decisions and behaving like a monopolist. And in a true monopoly, um, you have one entity that owns all the production capacity. So, we're starting with a really, really simple case, and we won't get more complicated than this. And this is where there are two factories or two production units. And so the, the, the very first thing that we have to do, and I actually think this is done a little bit, but maybe not. And let's take a look at the cost curves. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. No, I don't think there's a, there's a good um, illustration of this in the, the cost curves. But what you have here is you've got um, two production units and then notice that, um, remember the, the marginal cost curve is the information that we use for the supply. And so, so um, here you've got two different production units and their costs are not identical. Um, and I don't know. So let's let's talk to somebody really quickly. Um, let's see. How about uh, Miles? How are you doing, Miles? I'm doing good. Okay. So hopefully you had a nice spring break. Did you? Did yeah, it was all right. Did you do anything special? Oh, I just went snowboarding for a couple of days. Says the Nario. Oh, really? Where'd you go? Oh, just a big. Okay, it's a big bear. Yeah. So, so uh, a couple of my daughters went up to Big Bear too, 
And um, so how how was the snow? They said it was super slushy. Yeah, it was definitely spring skiing. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to put this here and paste. Okay, so you can see the question, right, Miles, over here. This is a monopoly cartel. And what we want to pay attention to is the difference between the production units. Now, um, so, so what I want to do um, to begin, Miles, is so look at these two marginal cost curves for these two different production units. And um, what I would recommend, and I'm not saying you guys need to do this on um, every single question when you're like working on an exam later, but as you're learning this, material what you want to do the first thing you want to do is you want to you want to graph these things so i'm gonna graph one of them let's say in red and can you see this miles oh yeah okay and i'm gonna put the other one in say orange. Okay. Okay. So if I was going to label this the the red one, what's is the red one for firm one or for firm two? Oh the second one? Yeah, so you think you think the red one is the the fifty nine? Well, okay. Well, let's just make sure. Yeah, actually, no, no. Okay, so yeah, so this is obviously the intercept of fifty nine, and this one is obviously the intercept of forty. Let's make sure we have our slopes right. So fifty nine and four. Oh, okay. I think this one is drawn incorrectly, right? And let's see if we can get it. It should actually look like that, right? And do you see why, Mile? Because the slope is bigger. That's why I was confused. Of yeah, so the slope is steeper, right? So. And I'll I'll say it this way, and this is language that um, you'll hear economists use some sometime. So, does one of these production units have what you might call a cost advantage? I think the first one. Yeah. So th this is MC one right illustrated and this is mc2 the second factory or the second production unit and so so tell me um why you think the first one has put in words why does it have a cost advantage A lower starting cost and variable cost. Yeah. So, so remember, the marginal cost here is the cost of producing each unit, right? And this is probably seems a little bit weird, right? Be, I mean, it shouldn't. But you know, if you were just first looking at this, you might go, "Oh, well, that's kind of strange. Why you know, is it this way?" But then you'd figure out, you'd like, okay, when they first start producing they're kind of like minimum cost for producing the first unit is $40, right? And then as they expand production, 
right? Their cost for each additional unit they produce goes up. This is basic diminishing returns. So you'll um, almost always see an increasing marginal cost function. That's typical. Um, but this one, the, the second factory, it has a sort of, again, like minimum cost for producing it. It just starts out production a $59, right? And then it goes up more quickly, right? So, so here's a, here's another kind of point. So you have these two production units and let's just throw in uh, a price, right? And let's say there's a market price here of, we'll just make it $100 per unit. Okay, Miles. So, so you're trying to um, maximize your profit, right? How much would you produce at factory one and how much would you produce at factory two? Given the information that you have here. Are you with us, Miles? Yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. It's uh, kind of been a long break. I think I need a refresher. Is it where they, they intersect with the 100? Well, well, yeah. So our, our basic idea, and this is one of the things you should remember from competition, and we'll have a chance to talk about, about it a little bit more. But under competition, um, generally, right, you end up with this rule that to maximize profit, you choose a quantity where price is equal to marginal cost, right? So, yeah, I do remember. So, yeah, if 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 you knew that there was a market price, um, then then sure. I mean, that's exactly what you would do. Is you would choose, uh, you know, price equals marginal cost, and then, um, and you know, I, instead of putting specific numbers here, well, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a little stamp here and here, okay? But the point is under competition, if these firms were run independently, they would both be maximizing their profits by choosing prices equal to marginal cost. And I also want to kind of um, um, point something out. And, and um, for all of you right now, as we go into the kind of final stretch of this class, I'm going to be relying on, on you all um, to watch the outside lecture videos um, more intensively and and to take good notes um, doing that because you know in a typical class there's also a lot of outside reading and things like that we don't have time to cover everything in class so if a lot of this stuff is starting to look unfamiliar or anything like that one of the things um, I'll try to do is is um, you know we have our divided, playlists, but I also have um, additional lectures from principles of micro where some of this stuff um, can be reviewed, right? Because this is intermediate I and mean, you guys may have had principles a little while ago, but um, I'm assuming that, that all of your principles knowledge is intact. And if it's not, then, um, you know, 
this will be um, something that you have to, to, to work on for us to be able to build on it. But yeah, so this, this general rule of price is equal to marginal cost, it, it's explained in the lecture videos um, that I have posted, but you should, you should remember that. But the main point is, Miles, notice that, that if you were operating these as um, a single entity, right? So these are like two different factories run by one monopolist. It, you know, common sense tells you this and see if you follow me. Are you with me, Miles? Okay. I'm going to ask you to do um, like I, I did with uh, Michael Left for a minute. Can you just stay unmuted and talk to me for a second? Okay. Are you there? All right. All right. Okay. So, so just, just notice, right, that, that whether you're running these factories as one entity, doesn't it make sense to you that you would want to utilize the production capacity at, let's call this the, the low cost factory first, right? Yeah, definitely. Right, because you know we said before that profit maximization implies cost minimization. So mm -hmm. one of the ways that you maximize your profits is by keeping your costs as low as possible. That should make perfect sense. So you'd want to utilize the, the low cost factory first. And then at some point, but notice this, okay, Miles, at some point, because of diminishing returns, actually producing at the low cost factory begins to cost more than at the high cost factory because at the high cost factory you have to start producing before you hit diminishing returns so so watch this okay miles see this line look right there okay you see what i did yeah so so notice Right. If you were thinking about this, okay, I'm just going to intuitively now the math is going to guide you in the same direction, but but um, intuitively, if I just want to minimize costs, right, I would start out here at the low cost factory, and then when I got to the quantity at the low cost factory where the marginal cost was equal to the marginal cost of the high cost factory, then I would switch. And now, right, I wouldn't begin producing at the high cost factory only, right? What I would do is, let me see. Um, what I would do, now watch this, Miles. Now I begin producing at both of them at the same time. You see how I'm moving up this line together? But my rule is I'm keeping them at the same marginal cost. Do you get what I mean? I'm dividing yeah. my output between the two factories. I am producing you know, more intensively, like most of my production is coming from the low cost factory, but some of it's coming from the high cost factory because the way in which I'm using high and low is really more in a, a loose metaphorical sense, right? Because I'm just talking about the way the graphs look, the marginal cost for firm two, is everywhere above the marginal cost for firm one if I'm comparing just looking at the quantities. But what that means is that that um, as I combine these um, two um, you know production units, really what I'm going to do, and I'll try to illustrate it here, is I'm going to do this horizontal summation where I add 
right? Um, the the production um, together, moving um, the quantities together, matching by prices and marginal costs as I go up. And then um, eventually, and this is a little bit hard to see because if I'm adding the quantities, then it's going to actually end up looking like like this, right? And you can't see that um, really clearly here. Um, you can just kind of imagine it. What we really have to do is go through the process of, process of constructing the, the um, joint marginal cost curve which is um you know what what we've been working on so but the point of the joint marginal cost curve okay and so i'll put down another rule here is under monopoly right that mc1 is going to be equal to the mc two that's going to be the first part of our rule the other thing that that um and this was just kind of to to get us to understand why we need to construct the the joint marginal cost curve for the cartel um but the thing that's kind of missing here is the price right and and so I pretended that there was a market price, but you know, under monopoly or monopoly cartel, there isn't a market price independent of what the monopolist chooses. Remember that the monopolist is a, a price maker, right? So the typical monopoly looks like this. So I'm gonna draw the, the, this would be the monopolist marginal cost curve. And I'm just gonna call this MC joint, okay. The MC for the monopolist, right? And then we would have a demand curve, which none of that was on the, we didn't have anything about demand on the, the, the prior um, diagram. And then we would have a monopolist marginal revenue. And then the monopoly equilibrium is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Does that does this look familiar, Miles? Are you are you there? Oh yeah. Yeah, it looks it looks familiar. Yeah. So, 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 and then from that monopoly quantity, um, we would take the monopoly quantity up and we would find the monopolist price. So, so what a lot of people say, um, I'll call this QM and then up here, PM is what a lot of people say is that the monopolist doesn't have a supply curve. Do, 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 does that make sense to you, um, Miles? Uh, yeah. 
Okay, did you want to try to explain why the monopolist doesn't have a supply curve? You're like, yeah, it makes sense, but I can't explain it. <laughs> Come on, give a, take a stab at it. Or maybe we should open up to anybody. Does anybody want to tell me why Monopoly doesn't have a supply curve? What about um, Chinlin or Ruben? Russell. Um, because he's the only sp uh, supplier. Well, yeah, but but that kind of doesn't explain it exactly, right? He doesn't have a supply curve because he's the only supplier. He's the only supplier. Uh, I don't know. Well. It, it, do you want to try to put a little bit more on that explanation or I think that was Chinlin, right? Yeah. How about uh, anybody else? Jeff, uh, Emilio. Um, hey, Professor. Yeah. Who's it? Um, uh, my guess would be that um, there, there are. Um, it's not, it's not a competitive market at this point. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <clears throat> um, but okay. So, so, so the point is, it, it, it follow me. Who, who was I just talking to? I, I recognize the voice, but I can't. Didn't see. Mike Barber. Barber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Michael. Um, Barbe. Okay. So Michael, um, normally what happens, right, when we have a, a supply curve is, um, let's just say if this MC joint was a supply curve, it looks like a supply curve, right? Yes. Right. And, and in the case of competition, supply is marginal cost. But now with monopoly, what's going on is, right, the price and the quantity are jointly determined, right? Um, so I can't say for a monopolist, oh, at this price, they'll supply this quantity. I don't know that, right? Because the quantity is determined by the intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost. So it's not until the monopolist determines their quantity that we can look up and see what their price is off of the demand curve. Right? Do you see what I mean, Michael? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, so 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 there is no supply curve. There's just this relationship that the monopolist is trying to maximize their profit. In order to maximize their profit, they choose a quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost they get their quantity and then we can find the price that they'll charge. Um, and they charge that price because that's the maximum price they can charge to sell this quantity. Um, so anyway, hopefully hopefully that makes sense. Um, obviously, if, if, if you all have specific questions, you know, you're welcome to ask them. Um, maybe after you go through the other videos and stuff like that. But I wanna um, focus uh, a little bit more on the um, essentials for us to be able to solve these kinds of problems. So our, our first thing that we have to do in the case of this um, um, joint um, profit maximizing cartel, this joint monopoly with two different production units is we have to find its joint um, marginal cost curve. And um, so I talk about that in detail in the videos, but I wanna um, take just a minute and, and focus on a special case. And I'm focusing on this special case because it's the easiest possible case and this is the one case where I told you all that um, a lot of the questions on the final exam have been modified to make them a little bit easier. 
remember one of our biggest problems here um, in combining these um, individual marginal cost curves into a joint marginal cost curve is this issue that, well, because of the differences in the marginal costs in particular, that they have um, a different intercept term, right? That 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 issue means, well, we, we really have this joint marginal cost curve where um, we're adding the quantities in the horizontal dimension and they're not transparently related to one another. In fact, what you end up with is you end up with this joint marginal cost curve. If you guys, again, go through the lectures in detail and, and you follow along carefully, um, then you'll see, okay, well, the way that the joint marginal cost curve works is, you know, we're doing the horizontal summation as, you know, we've done in the case of combining demand curves for individuals. But what that means is that we get to um, this particular, and I'm going to try to, to, to illustrate this, is <clears throat> you get to the minimum of the high cost factories, um, marginal cost, and then you have to add it, um, again, the quantities horizontally so that, um, you know, <clears throat> try to get it to, so you end up with something that looks like this, which is, Again, I'm going to call it J hat, right? Because it's part of the joint marginal cost function. But the true joint marginal cost function means that I'm going to follow along and produce only at the low cost factory until I hit the minimum of what the high cost factory can produce. And then I'm gonna follow along this leg of the joint marginal cost function. So my true marginal joint marginal cost function is the whole highlighted orange area. And it's a piecewise function. Part of it is just, um, the marginal cost of firm one down here, but then eventually we get this part of it that's this you know combined um, equation where we're adding up MC1 and MC2, but horizontally, we're not stacking them vertically. And this is again, one of the things that is explained in, in, in great detail, but you can see hopefully um, let's talk to, to Arslan. Are you there, Arslan? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you see, Arslan, how this makes our analysis more complicated, right? Because we have to know this switching point, right? Um, where yeah. you begin producing at both factories. So um, even though like that's like a fun problem, um, what I do for most of the um, exam, the final exam, is I say, okay, we're going to have them both start producing at zero. And so the MC1 looks this way, and the MC2 looks this way. And now hopefully you can see that it's gonna be a lot easier to combine them because we don't have to worry about the intercept. They both come out of the origin. Does that make sense? Yeah, that why, makes sense. Why it's easier. So we're gonna have something like this. MC1 
is equal to four Q and MC two. Well, let's make the numbers a little bit easier. We'll do two Q is equal to four Q. So, and then the question is, okay, so what is the MC joint? Okay. So um, what you hopefully are gonna remember from the lecture online, and maybe I wanna change the color of this one. So, Okay, so this is our first step is we have to construct the MC joint. So, so um, in order to do this, there are a, a number of steps you have to take. One is you have to invert um, both MC1 and MC2. And then the second step is you have to add the result. And then the third step is invert the result. If you don't do those three steps, you won't be able to um, um, construct the MC joint. So, so when I say, um, you know, invert does that make sense to you um arslan um i i think i'd like to see it first yeah yeah so so um let's go here hopefully i can get the cursor to go where i want it to Okay, there. Okay, so the first step of inversion is, and you, you may remember this. So if you have an equation, remember MC1 for us is just basically what we're graphing on the, the Y dimension, the ordinate, right? Is where you just, if you have equation Y is equal to three X, you just solve it in terms of X or put X on the left-hand side. It's like you're inverting the axes. So in this case, we would say Q is equal to one half. And I'm just gonna put MC. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And so obviously for the, the next one, I'm gonna say Q and I want to make a little distinction here, okay, between Q1 and Q2. And I'm only doing this because <clears throat> I think it it makes it a little bit easier to follow um, the next step. So this is going to be, and hopefully I can be clear about, you know, what are the coefficients and one quarter MC, okay? And then, so so th this is the, the first inversion step here. Okay, so I'm gonna put one, okay? And then the, the next step is to add, right? <clears throat> so, so what exactly do we mean by adding in this context? Well, <clears throat> so notice how I, I did away with the label on MC1 and MC2. And that was intentional because obviously if we're gonna add these 
equations if we're just going to add them in a, a, a street straightforward way um we would and let me try to illustrate this carefully on a draw a little curly brace here okay to show that we're adding them so if i was just to add these in in a really straightforward way then um i would just say okay i'm going to add the left hand side q1 plus q2 is equal to one half mc plus one quarter mc and and this is really so are you with me arslan does that does that yeah, make sense what i did yeah so yeah. um this is where actually the relabeling of the variables this is the economics. This is the applied mathematics. If if you were a math major and I just did that, you would probably freak out because you'd go like, oh, well, wait a minute. Like, we don't know. I mean, if we hadn't illustrated them and you weren't really careful, you might think, oh, gosh, well, MC1 is a different variable name. I can't just assume that MC1 is MC2. But what's really going on here? And then, then um, you know, I had that as you know just Q, and then um, you know now I'm saying that I can just add you know Q1 and 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 Q2. Like uh, I'm I'm not sure. Like there's not really a formula to do that. This is just reasoning out um, what the math is supposed to mean, and and. So the justification is this, Arslan, are you with me on like why it could be confusing? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, so, but the reason I did that is that, that now that we're running these as a joint operation, right? Then the actual marginal cost of the firm running two different factories is going to be based on their management decisions. So they're getting costs from both the factories and they're managing those factories to minimize the costs across production units. There's a lot of different ways. And again, if you go through the um, lectures that are posted online in detail to justify um, this, but basically what you end up with in the end is this idea that, oh yeah, the reason why MC1 and MC2 end up being the same is because in order to minimize costs, if you look at a cost minimization problem across joint factories, it implies that when they're being operated most efficiently, right? So optimally, then their marginal costs are actually going to be equalized. So it's this part here, okay. So so what what we're dealing with, Arsten, is remember we had this line that we were following before, and we said, oh, well, if we're trying to figure out how to share output between these two factories, we're going to do it such a way that they're both producing something, and um you know, their marginal costs are equalized, right? So it's this part here, right? So, so we use that result and our special case is they're both producing all the time because they both have a marginal cost that's coming straight out of the origin. So there's never gonna be this thing where like one of them is producing and the other one isn't, right? So that's our justification for no longer distinguishing um, between you know marginal cost from firm one and marginal cost from firm two or factory one and factory two 
they're being run as a joint operation. <clears throat> so um, the, the one of the thing that's missing here is that, <clears throat> and you're gonna see this come up a lot, is that there's also not no longer a quantity distinction from the monopolist point of view. They're producing output at two different factories and that's just their total output. So we just put, uh, hopefully I can get this to spread out a little bit more. So just the Q for the monopolists, right? Their total quantity is equal to N one half plus one quarter is three quarters MC. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then we have our last step, which is we want to be able to graph the MC joint on the same set of axes. So in order to do that, we have to invert again. So let me. And this is our last step, which is our second inversion. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so we're just gonna end up with MC, and I'm going to put it as joint, right, is equal to four thirds Q. And, and I'll just put QM, okay, for the monopolous quantity. So that's going to be our equation that and 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 notice this arslan you with me right yeah so so notice that now the coefficient right is four thirds it's a smaller slope coefficient than either of the factories on its own right the two factories on their own have slope coefficients of four and two respectively. And this one just has a slope coefficient of one and a third, right? So obviously our MC joint illustration as being lower than both of the two factories individually makes sense. Do you see what I mean? That makes sense. Yeah, so whether it, it makes perfect sense or not, this is, this is the procedure that you have to follow to construct the joint marginal cost curve. And once you construct the joint marginal cost curve, then you can solve the monopolies problem, find the monopoly level of output or the cartel level of output, um, just as you normally would. Okay, um, so, and I don't think, but I'll double check, um, let's go look. I don't think there are any problems that are quite that simple on, um, let's see if there's any on the cartel, no. And, Ah, okay. 
so so when we get to the um corno right notice we have these simpler uh, marginal cost curves like the ones um that that i was using in the illustration okay and let's see that's leader follower stuff okay which we'll cover at the end so um so i'll tell you what what i would like to do and this is just uh, by way of of um thinking about how um things are going to be on the final let's and we'll try to get it uh maybe ones that are nine ten eight, uh, 10, 10. Mm. Okay, let's do this one. Okay, so we're going to use this question, right? Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to compare the um, the competitive and the monopoly outcomes. We're not going to do the Corneau. So let me go ahead and um, go back to the whiteboard and Well, okay. Okay. So, so this is going to be our example. So, we're not going to do this, we'll modify it. Okay, so I'll ask, it's, it's 9.03, we can, and I'll, I know you guys have an exam coming up on, on Thursday, and even though I'm kind of eager to move, <laughs> hey, my dogs are barking at squirrels, okay, be nice. Okay, so, but I'll ask you, you, you all, we could, um, we can um, do this right now. And I su suppose um, what I'll, I'll do is, um, okay. Yeah. Um, so let's let's first and so Andres, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So I'm going to ask you and um, Celine, you here? Yes. 
Okay. Okay. So Andres and Celine and um, um, Devara. Are you here, Devara? Yeah. Okay. So, so <clears throat> go ahead. So Celine, Andres, and, and Devara. Go ahead and, and construct um, the, the joint marginal cost curve. And then we'll come back to you in about, or I'll come back to you in about um, five minutes. So, so, so you might want to write it down just so you have the information here. MC1 is 5Q, MC2 is 5Q. It's, it's a pretty simple example. And then this is the methodology that we use. Um, do you, you all have any questions? Back to the first, yeah. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. Professor. Yeah. Can you go back to the previous um, slide? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So yeah, I, I'm I'm not going to leave it on this one because it's really simple. It's MC one is equal to five. MC two is equal to five. Um, you know, Q five Q. But this has the methodology on it. So um, let's. Let's let's um, pause on this one. But yeah, so so this is the the main thing that we're gonna do. Um, here's the simple illustration. There are no intercept terms, and we can combine them. We can find a joint marginal cost curve. We can find the competitive equilibrium and the monopoly equilibrium in a pretty straightforward way. Okay, so 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 let's let's talk, um, Michael. Or, or you have your mic. Okay. Do you have a mic, Michael? Uh, I yeah, I just uh, it just clicks off and on sometimes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll tr we'll try to try to try to leave it open for a minute just so we can um, coordinate. Okay. So so you're talking about um, on the monopoly homework. Yeah, on the monopoly one. Okay. So you say. Number 15, yeah, so this is where we get into the, the, the joint marginal cost curves, right? Um, and and um, let me see if I can get something that even looks a little bit easier than, than that one. Not that there was anything wrong with it. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I suppose, I suppose um, these work. So, so, Try to frame your question for me the best that you can. What part of it is confusing to you? Well, in your example, you only had um, you only had uh, the variable cost, and now you have the fixed cost in there. So I'm a little confused as to uh, do you invert the whole um, the whole problem, yes. like using x, exchanging x for y, and then yes, finding the inverse. Okay. Yeah. So you you do exactly the same thing, and I want to tell you also that that um, you know I, I would I would go so far as to say that um, you know these questions are um, you know a, a little bit uh, more challenging than um, you know. I would have you spend time on it at this point. I know it's part of the homework and I think it's very, it's very good. And, you know, to go through, if you want to go through the, the recorded lectures in detail, I'll kind of give you a heads up here though. Okay. Besides that, you're not going to see something so complicated on the last exam. Um, I also want to, so this is, 
this is the, the whiteboard. Do you see the whiteboard, Michael? Michael? Yeah, I see it. Okay. Okay. So, and I'll put, Celine, you're in charge of, if you would be, the chat, because I have to remove that. If somebody put something in the chat I should know about, let me know, because I have, I need more room to work. <laughs> Okay. 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 Thanks, Celine. Okay. So here's the problem. Okay. And it, it, it's as I suggested before, Michael. Yeah. These actually, they're not really tough problems. It's just that you have to go through them very carefully and and, um, you know, most people don't take the time to just slow down and go like, okay, what's really going on here, right? If I was you and I was trying to do a really good job on, on this homework assignment and make sure that I felt comfortable with it, you really have to illustrate stuff. If you don't, you know, maybe you're, ability and I, mine is actually pretty good though i have to say my wife is something of a genius at this i don't know why but she has a, a really good ability of um you know the say called spatial reasoning you know like uh seeing things in in um different you know perspectives keeping it in her head at once I, I I thought I was pretty good until I met her. And then I was like, wow, okay, you're really good at this. Um, but so, so for most people, including me, um, what I've got to do. So notice here, we, we've got two parallel lines, right? Do you see what I'm drawing? Yeah, I follow. Uh, all right. So they're parallel because the slopes are the same, right? which is just a coincidence doesn't have to be this way but but it but it is and if you if you don't draw these out then i think that it's going to be really difficult for for uh you know you to see what's going on so if you're like okay i don't understand why the answer is this way then um it's probably because you didn't draw it out um, and maybe you don't because of that you don't understand so what I'm going to do is um, put a different color in here I'm going to try to do like a dashed line because it's not this line is not illustrative of anything except for where the joint marginal cost function um, kind of starts, right? So, so, so the point of a monopolist, a cartel managing um, these two factories, again, is to maximize its profits. So it wants to minimize its costs. So, um, notice the MC1 is the low cost one. I didn't label it. Um, but, right, if you were running this factory or these two factories, you'd use the low cost one until you got to where the green dashed line is. And then you would start to use both of them, right? Because now they both have a cost of 84 per unit and it's going up at the same rate. Do you see what I mean? Michael? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if you don't get that, and a lot of people don't, because, you know, it, it, it's funny, you know, we have these models, these mathematical models, and the mathematical models are meant to reflect reality, right? Um, but uh, a lot of people, they just want to look at the math and forget about the reality. And that's fatal, I mean, it will destroy the analysis in this type of a setting where, um, 
the equations have to be interpreted correctly in order to reflect the right reality. So, okay, what do, what do, what do I, I mean by that? Well, okay, so let's go ahead and, um, you know, go through our process. So in order to, to solve these equations, right, we have this process, which is invert, right? And then our next step is add. And then the result is, and then we invert again, and we get this result, right? Which we called um, the joint marginal cost function. If we just do that math here, Michael, it, it's gonna work out just fine. So we have MC1, right? I'll just do one of them and then you can do the other one. Maybe we'll do it together. Is 37 plus four Q, right? Yeah. Right? So if I'm gonna invert that, then I'm gonna do MC1 minus 37, right? Is equal to four Q, right? That makes sense? Yeah, and then divide by four. Yeah, then I divide by four. So I end up with, I'll call it Q1, <clears throat> which is the amount of output coming from just that one um, particular factory. And so I'm gonna do one quarter MC minus 37 divided by four, okay? So so you, you do the other one and tell me what it is when it's inverted. I got Q2 equals um, uh, one four. Um, one fourth MC, right? Yeah, one fourth MC minus uh, 84 divided by four. 84 divided by four, okay. So then we add them together and we will get Q1 plus Q2, which we know is just going to be the, the combined amount, right? Q, which we'll, we can relabel that in a minute, is equal to what? Um, I got 4X plus 121 over uh, 2. Okay. 4X over 2X. 2x right. plus 121 divided by 2. Well, I got right here, right? One oh, I mean, plus... I, I inverted it. I, that's yeah, so yeah. So we got to do the steps, right? <laughs> my bad. Okay, so I have one half MC and then minus, uh, uh, okay, so 37 divided by 4 plus 84 divided by four. So I can just add the, the numerators, right? So um, so that would be um, 121. Yeah, and then uh, divided by four, right? Okay, so, so, so that's all good. Um, but I'm gonna do something a little bit different, just kind of in anticipation. I'm going to write this as two over four. So there's still a common denominator, right? Just to make life a little bit easier. And, and so now I'm going to call Q1 plus Q2 just my joint, right? And then I'm going to um, add 121 divided by four to both sides is equal to two over four MC, right? And uh, and um, then I go ahead, I would multiply um, both sides by four, right? Um, and we'll get, um, One twenty-one. I'm just starting to to write things in a way um, 
that is going to look <laughs> similar to the way we want it to look at the end. So we have two MC. And then finally, um, we'll end up with MC J is equal to um, 121 divided by two. So that's going to be 60.5, right? Yeah. Um, and then one over two Q. OK, so I think that looks good, right? I didn't have to maybe then put this QJ here. Right. So now let's graph this line. Okay. So the first thing that I want I want you to notice, right? And it is that so the slope is again, it's um oh sorry, this should be plus there. You don't uh um oh and well you don't invert the q uh, back um because you added it but you didn't invert the last time. Did you did you do that on I missed that step? Well, yeah. So, so, so here is where I did the the, the last inversion, right? Oh, okay. Right. So, so here we have MC with a coefficient of two. I divided both sides by two to get to the final equation. So MC now is by itself. Professor, I think the um, divided, the coefficient of two, two at the end should be two. Yeah, the four divided by two is two. Oh, no. hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because that's what I got. I got two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm trying to, to do math, talk, and draw at the same time. So, okay. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. So, that, so, so yeah, four divided by two is two. Sure. Got it. Um, so, but, but the thing I want you to notice, okay, so the slopes here are four. The slope there is two. And then notice that the, the, um, the intercept term, 60.5, right, is actually, and I'm trying to highlight it, but it's not letting me, so whatever. Um, but the intercept term is actually between the two intercepts of MC1 and MC2, right? So if I'm going to illustrate this curve, this is the way that it's going to it's going to look. Um, it's going to be someplace in there, and then it's going to cross. And this is the thing that you wouldn't know unless you illustrated very carefully. But notice that it crosses. In this case, remember the lower one is. is MC1. And so, so this whole line we're calling, and I should actually call it something a little bit different because it's, it's not really MC joint. It's MC like joint kind of. It's like part of it, right? Because the true MC joint, the, the production path that the firm will follow um, is going to be, I'm producing here. You see, you, you see Michael Quintana? Yeah, I see. Until I equalize the marginal cost for both of them by driving up um, the cost at the low cost factory MC1 to the minimum cost of the high cost factory. And then I begin producing at both of them. Okay. So that this blue highlighted portion of these two different linear equations, the first one is MC1, right? And the second one is that line there, which is part of the MC joint. The blue one is the actual true um mc joint it's a piecewise function 
I don't remember. Michael Katana, do you remember piecewise functions from algebra or yeah. calculus yes. or anything? Yeah. So it's a piecewise function in this case. And the lower piece of it is just the marginal cost from one or of factory one. And then it's this other combined equation when you get above the price of 84. Okay. So does that help? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I was just a little confused on the inversion of the whole equation part, but no, um, I kind of get in a yeah well i mean the inversion straightforward it's just you have to isolate you know the q on one side like we did um you know here and let me see if i can get the spotlight thing to come up right this is the inversion part the only thing that's different is you have to subtract off the constant the intercept term yeah and then go ahead and proceed as you would Right. Yes. So, so could you yeah, point out the second inversion point? <clears throat> um, the second inversion, you mean like this one here? Yeah, that step. Yeah. So, so here's where I add them together. Right. And so maybe I should highlight that. Um, this is add. So, and obviously you have to invert both of them. So invert one, and this is also invert. And then once they're combined, so, so my inversion for the second part, right? I, I just did it in two pieces. Do you, do you see what I, I mean, Arslan? I, once I have the, the equations added together, then I begin, right, by saying, okay, Q1 plus Q2 is just Q. Do you see Arslan? Yeah. And then I add the constant back onto that side. And then I have this coefficient in front of the MC term. And then, so, so, so the, the, the second inversion is done in two pieces here. Um, There's the second inversion with, you know, culminating in the final um, line. Does that make sense? Right. One? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. So anyway, yeah, Michael Quintana, if you don't do this, then you won't get the, the right answer. And, and, you know, the other thing I'll point out, which is also kind of tricky, and um, we only have one minute left, but since you guys are asking, um, I'm going to tell you <laughs> because, um, it, you know, it's something that could cause you some amount of frustration if you're not careful. And that is that it depends, right? In, in the cartel equilibrium, we have two different cases. One is we have marginal costs crossing the, the and actually what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to get rid of um part of uh, of this so i'm going to get rid of the marginal cost for firm two and i'm going to shrink down this because the only relevant portion to us of um mc1 is now this first part right and um i'll also try to okay, see if I can okay there okay so so can you, you you see it so the only relevant part to us for MC1 <laughs> is this beginning part down here are you okay Michael Quintana yeah I'm following and 
And we would also never be interested in this lower part of the MC joint equation, right? So our true MC joint has these two segments. You can either have the marginal revenue, because remember for monopoly, marginal revenue equals marginal cost determines our equilibrium. You can have this kind of equilibrium where I'm producing on the MC joint portion where they're both producing, both factories are producing, or I can have a situation like this where the um, marginal revenue is intersecting with only that portion where the firm is producing just at its low cost factory, right? So the very first thing you have to do, and this is explained in the videos, is you have to figure out, am I dealing with this type of equilibrium where I'm utilizing both factories, or am I dealing with this type of equilibrium where I'm dealing with just one factory? Do you see what I mean? Yes. And, and that will help you figure out, you know, whether or not, you know, I mean, in a simple case, you're just dealing with producing only at one factory and you don't produce anything at the other factory and you know things are really straightforward sometimes you're producing at both of the factories if you're producing a larger quantity so um anyway pay attention to that part in the lecture if you're having trouble we can obviously um next time you know we get together next tuesday if, if you guys you know want to go over these types of problems we should have some time we just want to move on to the corno stuff um and i want to point one other thing out and that is that that notice um michael in in this type of a situation where you have no intercept you always have um a equilibrium where you're producing at both factories, right? Because they yeah. all start at zero. So that's another reason why this is a simpler case because you don't have to deal with the possibility that you're dealing with uh, an equilibrium where you know the firm is only gonna produce at one of its factories and not at the other one. But when you have the the intercept term that defines the marginal cost, then you have to be careful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, good luck. Remember to study your graphs and um, <clears throat> I'll send you guys um, information. I'll be on at 745. We'll use the, the same protocol we did before in terms of, of, of time and whatnot. Um, and have, you know, things turned on, turn it in. Um, if you get on first thing at, at um, 745, I won't answer any questions about like the material, but if you have any questions about like, okay, you know, is there something to pay attention to or, you know, issues about timing or anything like that for turning stuff in? Um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer those types of questions uh, before we begin the exam. Um, okay, um, so pay attention to your Hello, email. Sir Hunter. Yeah. Um, I have a question, but it's related to my Ignithium account. Oh, okay. Well, then just hold on and let everybody else go because I, I, um, I'll answer those questions to do with this your stuff. So, so, so okay. what, what is your your issue, Silly? I forgot my password. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me help you. Um, 